And welcome to a new episode of PR360, and I'm your host, Brett Dicer. If you please subscribe to PR360 on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all your other favorite podcasting hosting sites, and leave a five-star review, and subscribe to the YouTube page as well. Really will help with the rankings and help us with the YouTube page as well. But this week, I have Nicole Nazaro with me. We're going to talk about everything about mobile gaming if you've ever played mobile gaming before, if you ever were interested in how these mobile games become what they are today, this is the episode for you. But welcome to the show, Nicole. Awesome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. And the first question is all my guests is, are you coffee or tea drinker? Oh, hey, you know, it's tea all the way with me. Uh, tea's more fun, more flavors, more contemplative and completely less fuss. Kind of fits my personality. Gotcha. And you have any favorite tea brands that you specifically love? Oh, wow. Well, I love, I love chai is like kind of my favorite. Um, and uh, PG tips actually on the, on the Brit side is, uh, is my favorite, you know, straight out of the straight out of the box uh, brand. Gotcha. And then I gave a very brief introduction to who you are, but can you give our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So Nicole Lazaro, I'm the president and founder of Zio Design. And for the past 29 years or 30, I think it'll be 30 years in the summer, uh, I have been a game design consultant and developer uh, to the gaming industry. I, among other things, I designed the first, very first iPhone game. And I was also the first person to measure emotions on players' faces, uh, which led to a model called the Four Keys to Fun, which is used by millions of developers around the world. Tons of mobile games are built on it. And uh, the Four Keys is baked into the AI for The Sims. It inspired IBM, uh, IBM's uh, emotion analytics and led to this thing we call, you know, gamification. So uh, now I'm spending my time uh, between, you know, consulting in mobile and XR spaces and working on my own games, um, such as, you know, Follow the White Rabbit. Got you. And so talking about the Four Keys of Fun, can PR pros actually use this to do better strategies within their own companies and uh, industries? Absolutely, yeah. The, with the four keys, you can use it really in two ways. First of all is just to understand the fun. So it's a great uh, cheap seat or guide to understand the player motivations because people play games for really four reasons. They play for novelty, challenge, friendship, and meaning. So it helps you get uh, a sense of what's fun about the game right off the bat. And then the second thing you might want to do as a PR professional is to gamify promotion of the uh, of the um, of the game itself. And that's a little bit more than you know just adding um, you know points and badges. It can, you can actually use it to engage the you know person's curiosity and uh, you know have them feel like they're you know interacting with the game, even though they're not. Um, they can experience some of the interaction in the game, the fun of the game, even though they haven't yet downloaded it. Gotcha. Um, the other thing, yeah. You know, the other things I would say is that really all design is strategic. So the the player fun promotion, the revenue that comes out of it, and these four keys to fun, or it can be considered like the four keys to engagement, um, helps uh, help can also help um, uh, PR folks to innovate and create new strategies that really get people's attention. Because it's got it's all the baked into it is these the psychologies for what makes things fun. Mm. So it's almost like trying to figure out how to make your campaign fun or something like that in a way that gets people's attention or, or in that type of a way is what I'm understanding. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it can get everything from, you know, the direct, direct to the direct to the player or to, uh, to journalists or, you know, streamers such as yourself in the sense like, well, what's fun. You could actually design the promotion. I mean, a press release, they, there are tons of those out there. Not very fun. What is it that you can do to, uh, to, to, communicate the value, the player value and the, the, the entertainment value of the, um, of the inter experience uh, in the marketing itself, you know, in the promotion itself. Gotcha. So there are, you know, you know, what are the, instead of like just in addition to, you know, demographics and, um, you, know, uh, you know, age and, you know, gender and those sort of things or location, uh, you can really help, it can really help you dial into more of the psychographics and the motivation for why people play. 
So you can imagine like having a campaign where you explore to find, you know, you, you can explore it a little bit and it's rewarding to explore that campaign. It's, you know, it might reward um, a little bit of skill and challenge, you know, not just light, it might storytell really well. And uh, it might actually involve, or, you know, social interaction, you know, from the minimum of having great talking points that people want to talk about, chat about. Uh, but also the, that, you know, interacting with the game, campaign between people or with the characters in the game can also be rewarding. And of course, you know, being able to provide value uh, internally over, you know, over time can really be a great way um, to get more, you know, four keys, um, uh, help you create more strategies with the four keys. Got you. And then talking about gamification, you said you've helped yeah. start it or you started it yourself. So how has it changed since you almost developed or co-developed gamification? Yeah. So what I did was I measured by measuring emotion on people's faces um, with the four keys. I have this really tight relationship. The model has a tight relationships between the uh, the things that players do and the emotions they create. So if you have, you can, I mean, promoting a game, you can identify the different emotions that uh, players uh, like or that the brand is, you know, is is all about. You know, like Clash of Clans, it's all about revenge, right? Or you know, Candy Crush, it's all about. Um, you know, some of the, uh, it's all about the joy of acquisition and stuff like that. And then you can, uh, take, you know, then you can back out, back, back out from the emotions that you want into the interactions that you want to highlight in the game that create those emotions, for example, or you can actually put those interactions in the way you are interacting with the, uh, within the campaign. Now, gamification is a very broad uh, thing. You know, the four keys is, you know, one of the kind of the foundations. Um, there's, you know, several other, other things that contributed to it. Um, but the most important thing is to think uh, that it's don't to, to not trivialize it as to being, you know, simply, you know, added. Well, if I add points and badges to my experience or to my, you know, game promotion, then that'll be enough to get the word out there. And that's definitely not what you can do with the four keys is really get it into the uh, intrinsic valuation. What is the intrinsic feeling of playing that game and then highlighting that uh, for, you know, for, for people? And uh, the, you know, we've seen that and we've seen that stuff like with, um, you know, frame play, for example, they focus on intrinsic ads. A lot of things are changing with how games are marketed and, and promoted. Uh, and there are um, a lot of stuff that we can talk about in terms of new technologies like, you know, blockchain and, and uh, blockchain and crypto and the metaverse and all that, that kind of things as well. Mm -hmm. And then moving on to our actually specifically the mobile gaming yeah. space has grown up in a way or grown up since the, when you first created your game. So yeah. what should devs understand about the space now? Because it's not the same as it was before, even probably like two years ago or even five years ago. Yeah. Well, when I developed tilt, you know, tilt world, um, which is behind me here, it, um, you know, there was no app store. This was a week after the iPhone launched. So there was no app store. There were no apps. There were actually no other chiclets. It was just 12 items that came from Apple. And so what's interesting, the interesting story there actually is that can actually apply all the way now forward to today is that I designed the, um, the mechanic on what was fun or unique about the iPhone, which was rotating it. And you play, you know, you match green one way and blue the other way. You feed this little character named Flip. Uh, and then you had this over the shoulder experience. And people were like, wait, what are you doing? And then people could talk about like, hey, I'm playing a game on my iPhone. Wait, there are no games on the iPhone. And then, you know, and then, so then they would pass it around the URL and that's how we got, you know, like a million, you know, downloads on a web, on a web game, um, pretty, you know, within like the first, you know, couple of months. So the, uh, the, I think that that, those kind of core things are, you know, still drivers today. Um, the important thing for game marketing though, is of course that, you know, changes in ad targeting, uh, mean that the experience, you know, that we can't micro target individual players anymore by their, their ID. We have to go actually go back to more traditional, uh, ways of marketing and re reaching players. And it, th those, those campaigns actually have to now focus a lot more on the experience and, you know, friend, you know, friend, you know, highlighting the experience and then, uh, making, you know, and friend referrals are really key for that social, the social, um, the social exchanges or the social, you know, um, the social uh, promotion or the social, um, the social features in the game itself. And I believe that, you know, in the, in, on the long run, it's painful now, but for marketers now, but in the long run, it'll keep, you know, it'll get uh, game marketing a little bit more honest and focused on the in, um, entertainment proposition. And, you know, dare we say fun factor. 
And I think development will also hit that way too. So it's less of a, you know, sort of a monetization treadmill. And I hate the word monetization actually, and gamification actually too. But, you know, I, I really much rather talk about revenue and just a more, you know, kind of honest, direct, you know, conversation with, it's exchanging. I'm providing you value as a, an entertainment provider and you as the player are getting entertainment as the, you know, as the result. I'm not just trying to, I'm not just trying to manipulate you like, you know, you're a wallet with eyeballs. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's, that's really, that's really the, um, the big thing that's, um, that that's changed. It's obviously so super competitive. There's such a, you know, there was the big race to the bottom, which, um, which was quite painful, especially for the early, us early developers in the space. And now, um, with free to play, it is, you know, how do you get that balance, um, right. And your whole, that whole team that you're using to, you know, sort of work the revenue into the game in a way that, that feels good for players. It's very, it's very challenging. But I think there's also, you know, this opportunity for, you know, subscription-based um, monetization models, you know, with revenue, uh, with, you know, generating a recurring revenue alongside, you know, free-to-play, um, which has some really great, um, you know, there's some really great opportunities um, uh, there, there, I think, as well. Gotcha. Um, because the idea with, mon- with um, a uh, revenue is that you can get uh, a customer buying over time, you know, so that you can maintain your studio. Uh, you know, as a, you know, and you, you can, you, you can maintain that, that property for a much longer, much longer time. Mm-hmm. I mean, even going back to what you said about the marketing aspect of it and the changes that Apple and even Google mm-hmm. or Android are yeah. making with targeting, how do we get back to good ad targeting because of the basically getting rid of cookies, which helps with understanding this? Is there a newer way of doing it because I've just seen like the, like the YouTube ad apocalypse is almost like that for mobile specifically is that we don't know who we're targeting anymore. We got to figure this out again. Right, right, right. Well, I think that there, the other thing that's changed a lot is the rising of influencers and the bill. And that provides the opportunity for building community around the game. And it can be hard for a small developer to afford, you know, somebody at the very top of the food chain, but micro influencers are, you know, a really great. It can be a really great asset, in a sense that where you're, uh, where you have your big fan base, and then you know inside that big fan base there are, you know, several ones that have a little bit more reach, if you will, and forming those relationships is um, is not the same as being able to micro target, you know, an individual player, but with that influencer comes an installed base, right? And so those relationships over time um, work well and getting us to a point where there's a more, uh, more, more frequent, uh, you know, conversation about the game leading up to launch, though that pre-launch strategy is very key. Um, It's not like we can just drop it, you know, drop, you launch the game and then, you know, have a big, you know, sort of do a carpet bombing of, you know, ad ads to support it. Uh, I think having those, those key relationships up front, um, really, really helps. And with those relationships, you can also, you know, measure in a sense what kind of reach each of these key, uh, these key relationships have, and that can, that can help as well. But yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely painful right now and definitely changing, but I think there's also a huge opportunity for smaller developers because of this is because it's a lot, it, they have a lot more of a, um, uh, ability to, uh, they have a lot more ability to compete with the, with the majors, I guess, if you will. Um, because they're, you know, because of these new changes, um, they can be a lot more competitive. Gotcha. And then, I mean, you talked about it, the crowd space. So how can PR pros get more attention to their mobile games? Since there's so many mobile games now and so many more coming out, it's almost like you're trying just to get a little piece of the pie just to get attention for your game and to get people to actually download it. Right, right. Um, well, I think that the idea behind, you know, generating, you know, really generating, uh, you know, curiosity about, about the game to start with. And so that can be through, uh, featuring, uh, f- featuring the, like the exploration and role play and customization, you know, in the game that's possible, you know, to make it unique to, to you. Uh, and again, like how, um, what are the innovative points in this? What's making d- this game different? Uh, being sure to, you know, highlight that in the game. Uh, in the in the promotion and what uh, you give them the feelings that they get uh, that's very important that when they see the um, the marketing material the promotional event whatever what are the if it's generating the feelings that they most like about that game that are most strong in that genre 
if there's a good match, that really that really helps um, that really helps as well, uh, as well as the the social thing. So if there are social features or uh, ways in which you can develop the campaign to establish a relationship with the main characters in the game, for example, that can be a really big pull pull. Uh, as well as some of these new mechanics around um, generating value. So people play games to change how they think and how they feel and how they behave. And uh, now we have like what's happening now with um, with like the metaverse and, you know, things that are um, you know, new technologies like with Web3 is what's coming. So think about mobile attaching into Web3 is a huge opportunity. And with that, you have the ability to do what we call social collaboration. Uh, and it's social collaborative play, which is a whole new genre of things. So if you think about in like the sandbox, you can create, uh, you can uh, create experiences, you know, you can create, you know, three dimensional assets. You can have, there's a game layer where you can make them interactive. You can then there's a marketplace. So you and I could, you know, put on an escape room for, for our friends, or we could, we could put, uh, we could actually create a template for that escape room and then sell it to other players and have tickets. So these new play to earn models are interesting, uh, a, a little bit and challenging at the same time, because of course, if you pay somebody or if I earn something from a game experience, it's no longer completely voluntary. It's, it becomes a little bit wor- like work because I'm getting value back. So you need to make sure that that, um, that play to earn um, doesn't, doesn't destroy the fun, right? It keeps the fun, fun intrinsic. But the idea of being able to put on a play with your friends is, is quite compelling. And I think that there's going to be a lot of new genres there. And again, like where you can use the four keys is you can use it for, you know, the, the actual game design and also in how you promote it. And if there are promotional games, you know, you can have, you know, simple things like passport, you know, stamping passports or, you know, earning a certain number of points. Um, but you can get also, um, if you can also innovate in how it's rolling out, uh, that can get a lot of uh, attention, attention as well. So, and especially there's lots of really interesting stuff um, for mobile XR, for example, that could be really fun uh, for, for, for people, uh, for players gotcha. to, you know, kind of, kind of explore whether it's a, you know, that's, I think we see, we're seeing some really amazing things in like Roblox, for example, where you have these experiences and it's not just a store by, you know, Nike or Sephora or whatever, or, you know, uh, Vans, it's, uh, it's an experience that you can do. And so the marketing of uh, and Red Bull is as amazing is an amazing company. They've been doing this for you know decades. That they have um, it's not just like okay here's a can of Red Bull. They actually promote these experiences. And so if you like those experiences of professional athletes, for example, is what they're focused on. Uh, that creates the emotions uh, that then are very is a great way to target and excite the kind of people that would like your game. So if your ad campaign, if your promotional activities. Uh, create very strong emotions that match the game experience that really helps create pull marketing and pull, pull people in, especially as they can share stuff on social media. Mm -hmm. And then talking about more about the perception of mobile games, because sometimes it seems like mobile games are like a bait and switch. Sometimes, sometimes they'll show like an ad and the game doesn't look anything like what the ad is, has done. How to, how can developers and PR pros, in their campaigns, like avoid this because people don't like it when they're like, Oh, it's going to be this game. And I'm playing a completely different game than what I'm, what I was sold on, I guess. Well, the best advice I can give uh, marketers for games to not be seeing as uh, not be seen as doing a bait and switch is don't do that. Oh, <laughs> um, right. You know, it's like it, when you get it, I mean, it's one thing and we've done lots of demos for lots of very, of lots of amazing games. And, you know, you, you, you show it in its best light, but if you're going to completely, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a puzzle game, but you should advertise it as a first person shooter because you want that hardcore demographic, you know, you know, revenue, right? Whatever, you know, and then they find it's a puzzle game. It's like with cutscenes that look like first person, you know, you're not going to have happy, that's not going to convert, right? You'll get your first, you'll get your first met, you know, key metric Well, they download it. But then they're going to not attach because it wasn't the wasn't the right thing. But being more honest, again, more transparent, and again, you know, with uh, with ads, ad targeting, you know, being much more broad now, it's going to be harder to bait and switch. I mean, it's going to be less effective to bait and switch. And just being more honest and transparent about that. You, what is the unique? You know, we talk about unique value proposition. What is the unique entertainment proposition for the player? And then communicate that. And creating these little interactive ads where they can sort of sample it. That's that's really helpful. Um, 
and uh, you want to get engage uh, in honest conversations with players, especially if you're, you know, indie, but even, but major like titles as well, you want a very robust uh, community around your game on discord or on your own website or something like that. So that people are super excited and then they become your super fans then to promote, you know, to promote your, um, your thing at, uh, elsewhere. Um, and in the topic of bait and switch, there's also a related one because we have the, you know, the other beast in the room is, you know, the NF is NFTs, right? And other web, you know, web three stuff. And, you know, definitely check, tread carefully into those waters because there's a lot of backlash now against NFTs because it, you know, it feels like a scam. It feels like it doesn't feel like fun. It feels like you're trying to trick me. And uh, it can that if that's if that's not the core game mechanic, right? You know, if it's not some variant of Hitman or something where you, um, <laughs> I don't know, where the whole idea is to trick, you know, trick other players, or you know, um, there's a there's a you know like liars poker or something like that. Uh, if that's not the goal of the game, then you know let's let's be really careful because players are smart. Players are smart. Playing games make them smarter, right? Uh, and they're they're just not going to be fooled, right? You want to innovate. If you do that, innovate the gameplay in a way that's only possible on the blockchain. If you're doing a, a promotional campaign on the blockchain, then innovate that in a way that's only promotion. You know, that's only possible with blockchain. I mean, in a lot of it, a lot of stuff we have seen, and it's failed because it, that just should have been just good crypto, right? There's no reason for that to be on the chain. It's just like, okay, you're issuing this coin, but it's only good in your store on your game. So why not just you know make it? You know, why not just make a good crypto? It doesn't need to be on the chain. Um, so you know, based on my experience, the, the, the biggest challenge with, you know, blockchain games, for example, uh, is that they're just not fun yet. You know, they're just, you know, that's just the technology kind of interesting and innovative, but it's not, an, it doesn't, isn't creating a really fun experience. And likewise, the, you know, with the challenge with play to earn mechanics, uh, which is possible now on the block because of blockchain, it's, you know, you're getting that extrinsic external reward, you know, changing the fun factor of the inter intrinsic enjoyment of play. So you have to, we have to very, uh, you know, want to be sure that those mechanics are very unique, uh, unique with regards to, um, you know, Web3 technology. And then, uh, and then also um, with the, uh, you know, getting, getting something unique, getting something that's, that's uniquely fun. A good test of this is, you know, how is it related to like a DAO, like, you know, a decentralized, you know, um, autonomous organization? Like, how is it, is that, and that's a player community, right? It can be seen kind of as almost like a, um, an, an, an NGO, a nonprofit, you know, around it, a, a volunteer organization. But you've got very, you can develop very strong, um, you know, social uh, bonds around this thing if you've got, if you have one of those, um, you know, going, going forward. And, you know, I didn't really explain like what the four keys were, but essentially they, uh, they work in a relationship between, you know, with, with each other in a sense, you know, there's the, as I said, they play games for four reasons. It's like, they start with this curiosity, this hook that pulls you in and with exploration, role play and fantasy. Uh, and then like dribbling a basketball, it's just fun, but it's more fun if there's a goal and it's hard, it's like high overhead. And that's where challenge or hard fun comes in. And you want goals, obstacles, and strategies, you know, this mastery of skill. And so think about what that might meet, mean in your, in your promotion. And then we've got um, uh, people fun. So it's all about communication, cooperation, collaboration, competition for, you know, friendship and meaning and um, the feeling of schadenfreude and, um, and uh, you know, bond, you know, social bonding. And then the last one is related a lot to crypto and blockchain is all about serious fun which is where players play to change themselves. So whether it's to get, you know, super excited in a highly stimulating game, or it's to create this Zen calm, calm state, or it's to, you know, create something like a world in Roblox um, or in Minecraft that I can share with my friends uh, or in my case of Tilt World, you know, plant real trees in the real world. So it's something it's creating value and, and meaning for people. And when they feel bait and switch, you know, it's that you're really losing out on that serious fun component it doesn't feel like it's creating value. It's like, you promised me something. And then now I'm not getting, you know, what that, what that value is. So that's really, that's really important too. And I mean, moving on to more of the big publishers and more of the yeah. PC and consoles, they're actually starting to get yeah. into the mobile gaming with 
Call of Duty already being out. I think they're making another one supposedly. Yeah, Battlefield, yeah, yeah. Apex Legends, Diablo. I think Overwatch is supposed to get them become mobile. What can or is this a sign of mobile gaming maturing? And how how is this going to change when all these big AAA games are eventually going to get into mobile? Yeah, Fun. absolutely. I definitely think it is. Uh, it is on one hand the sign of uh, mobile maturing, and on the other side, it's possibly a sign of um, PC and console stagnating, right? And this is, you know, there's always been, you know, with I've been in, you know, games for you know going on thirty years, is that there's always been this like, is PC dead or is console dead? You know what? You know, they've always been like they, they would, the the industry would switch back and forth, and now there's three. It's now it's three way, and mobile is actually the biggest segment right now for sure. And I think it's a sign that there's less innovation on the other two, but there are a couple, several other factors. Um, it's, you know, like with Call of Duty Mobile, um, is that, you know, it's free to play. So it's a free to play thing. So you get like a that we saw with Tilt where we got a thousand times the downloads, free versus premium. Uh, mobile phone technology has increased, of course. Uh, so we now get a more robust experience on that. And I remember when uh, people said that there's no way you could get a first person shooter on a console. Because uh, you know, with PC and keyboard, you had to be that precise. Well, the same people are say we're saying that oh, you can't get a first-person shooter on mobile because X, Y, Z. And so, you know, we're, uh, Co Call of Duty Mobile is proving them wrong. Um, but people are growing up with mobile, so they don't have as much of a stigma against it as well. So if they grew up with mobile and now their parents can see them playing a PC game, they can't see them playing the mobile <laughs> version as easily. So you're getting a lot more hours that way. Uh, so this phone time is less regulated by parents. And it's because it's mobile, you can pick it up and put it down really easily. So you get those micro, you know, units of play. And working with, you know, we worked on games um, like uh, like Diner Dash, for example. We did about 40 projects for that franchise. And uh, it was, you know, you you could get a successful thing in like, you know, you know five, 10 minutes. And then, I mean, then you could get more and more and more. So this like kind of snacking behavior can really add up to a lot of um, lengthy um lengthy time, <clears throat> lengthy uh, experiences. Plus with Call of Duty, they got, they got esports. You know, they have esports with betting inside it. And then they have a mod, a mode for Battle Royale. And so the new one is rumored, you know, Call of Duty Warzone is rumored to be, you know, um, call, um, sorry, Battle Royale first forward. And the social mechanics of a Battle Royale are huge. That's what really drives a lot of play. And, you know, going back to a early, you know, my early MMO days is that, you know, we always say that, you know, players could, you know, consume content faster than we can create it. So that uh, people, but what we did is in a sense, like players, you know, come for the content, but then they stay for the community. And it's very hard to get a guild to move from one MMO to the other. So we want to make sure there's lots of social features, uh, lots of social interaction. And so these tournaments, you know, esports are, are part of that. And then if you think about, um, Fortnite is that it, um, a lot of people go there not to play the game at all. It's to socialize. Uh, a lot of sessions are just simply, um, so children of the eighties or whatever, you know, we would go to shopping malls to hang out as teens. Uh, well, people are going to Fortnite now, the, uh, today in today's world. Huh? Yeah. They have uh, what Fortnite concerts in Fortnite yeah. too, like virtual concerts through that as well. So yeah, yeah. a lot of them yeah, are going yeah. to socialize. Yeah, and I think we also had uh -huh. um, we also yeah we also have like you know um, League of Legends and a lot more you know um, a lot of stuff happening on mobile that is you know close to you know a more realistic uh, you know Call of Duty you know kind of experience, and then also I should say that the um, it's sort of a perfect storm in a sense because the the I think there was a lot of backlash on the latest franchise installment on PC and console. So people were like, yeah, we're not, you know, they weren't really thrilled with, with that version. A lot of people that were disgruntled fans were like, oh wait, but there's this thing on mobile. Let me try that. So I think they benefited a bit from, um, uh, you know, people shifting platforms because they were, um, it, the, the game's so large, I think that you can't even download all the maps. They can't really expand the game much more <laughs> on console because uh, there's just so much content already. So um, um, I think there's there's that going. They also they also you know, design their revenue stream rather well too in terms of the pa the pace of the upgrades and you could play it without you could play without monetizing, which I think is really important. You know, kind of close to what you were asking earlier about bait and switch, and you because know, oftentimes mobile game free plays will say, oh, you can play, you know, without spending a dime. Um, but 
you know, they, um, but then often you find you can't, you know, it's like, you know, to get a sword that does damage, you got to buy it, right? You know, here's a free sword that whatever. So going back and forth like that. Mm, got you. And then fun question for you. What more game would you like to make right now? I know you've made some before and you might be making mm -hmm. some now, but which, what would you like right now to make as a mobile game? Uh, I really want to make puzzle, you know, narrative puzzle exploration games with uh, on mobile with a touch of XR. Uh, so, you know, and that's what, you know, that's what I'm doing, like with follow the white rabbit. Um, and well, what I really want to do is like with tilt five, have you seen that? The, mm -hmm. um, the, with tilt five. Yeah. So it's basically, you know, I've got a couple of ideas about doing a headset XR headset attached to the mobile device. So you could play mobile, the mobile version, and then you could attach the headset for the uh, AR version for people that had the headset. I think that could be really, that could be really, really fun. So that XR mobile with um, XR, but the, um, the headset's really important because, you know, you're, you, you can't hold the phone up for very long, you know, with your, you know, like out there in the real world. I mean, you can do Pokemon, you know, but Pokemon, they, most of the people just turn it off, you know, cause it's uh, drains battery life and it's, you know, holding it out here to get the XR experience is good. But when it's on your face, when you have, um, and I've got the snap spectacles, when it's on your face, um, that um, Snap Spectacles is actually hands. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's all self-contained. Um, but Lenovo and Tilt Five, you know, you can plug it into a phone or a computer, and um, the uh, yeah, it's just it's just going to be really. It's just going to be a whole game changer. So the Qualcomm Snapdragon Spaces, you know, we've got Niantic, Lightship, we've got um, you know Eighth Wall, all kinds of really new tech. So I really love having new tech and then, cause that means new kinds of fun and it's a great place for a, a game designer. It's a great time to be a developer as well. Um, I do a lot of the development work myself within in Unity on our original games. And uh, it's a, I have a lot of fun doing that. Gotcha. And any final thoughts for listeners? Well, I think that the, what I've really encouraged folks to do is to think about like, how can, how can we use games to unlock human potential through play? You know, what is it about uh, games that can transform and entertain and, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, heal us, make us laugh, you know, you know take us out of our workaday existence? Uh, I really encourage people um, to do to do that. And that, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, these metaverse trends is that it's important to remember that there are uh, no wimps in the metaverse. And by that, I mean, there are no windows, icons, mice, pointers and solo play. And instead, we want to be more like in the metaverse. We really want to be more like Neo in the Matrix. And like, whoa. So instead of like windows of content, if you want your mobile game to feel more like the metaverse, even if it isn't, you know, it's just like instead of windows and scrolling feeds, endless scrolling feeds, endless scrolling feeds, uh, we want to have, um, we want to have instead of windows, we want to have worlds to explore, right? So we want that easy fun of world exploring a world. We want to have interact with our hands, with object, interact with objects with our hands. You know, and then uh, and then, you know, in a way that, you know, we can build skills over time somehow. And then the uh, even if it's just, you know, you know, you know, stroking the glass, but ideally, you know, out here with with glasses. And then if we want to have uh, avatars, so different ways to represent ourselves so that we are actually in the game. So how could the game use our body? There's great uh, there's great body tracking, amazing body tracking on uh, on um, on mobile right now using cameras. Uh, you know, both from Apple and from Google, right? You can do all kinds of things with your body. And then that collaborative social play I talked about earlier where, you know, we can, I've done like a little pocket opera where, you know, you can get like cost, you know, paper doll uh, costumes and you could, you know, put on a, put on an opera or, you know, you could, you could rent, you could sell tickets, you could rent the costumes, you know, all kinds of different fun things that can happen. Uh, so it's that, you know, new kinds of UX paradigms and, uh, new way, new technology that's, uh, available, you know, with these new, you know, web, web three kind of technologies, whether it's, you know, understanding the body, the world, you know, real world segmentation, or, um, you know, that more rich social, real time social interaction. Uh, we're used to games, like you push a button and then our character does that sword, sword flash. Right. Um, but now we can get our real bodies, you know, doing, doing that with a, with a higher degree than we were, was possible, like with uh, older technology, like the connect. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, it's going to be a whole new era for mobile gaming for sure. Well, thank you, Nicole, for joining PR 360 and sharing your knowledge on the mobile gaming space. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Brett. Uh, thank you for having me on and uh, let's go out and make some fun games. 
Yes. And thank you for listening to PR 360. As always, please subscribe to PR 360 on your favorite podcasting sites or apps and leave a five-star review if you like this episode. And as always, please subscribe to the YouTube for the video episodes as well. And join us next week as we talk to another great thought leader in the PR industry. All right, guys, stay safe, understand your mobile game and understand your community and see you next week. Later.